How many know God is good? Uh, how many know God is good all the time? I remember that first, uh, you know, when, when, when you would say God is good, and then I would respond all the time. You know, uh, that really became, I believe, the impetus for the song that we sang. I remember saying that 20 years ago, and I think the first time I ever said it was in Singapore, and you'll hear I chant. The, uh, the Peters talk a little bit about uh, Singapore in just a little bit. But uh, we're so glad that you're here today, and, uh, and especially our guests. And I had a chance to meet so many of them this morning as they were coming in. And, and so thank you for being with us today. And we pray that you'll be especially blessed and, and you may be seated. And uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, to our guests that we want to connect with you and we want you to know all the things that we're doing here as as a church we have a, a, just a variety of things that i think might be meaningful and even helpful to you like bible studies and, and small groups and so there's a connect card in the pew pocket ahead of you did you pull that out and give us information that we would be able to communicate with you we'd appreciate that we want to update you on all the things that we're doing if you're a first-time guest after the service, we've got a guest services area. You can just take it over there, and, and they just want to greet you and answer any questions that you might have, and they have something for you. If you're a second-time guest, we'd love to have you fill this out also and just put it in the offering bag a little bit later when it comes around. One more thing, and that is that our members, when your information changes, every once in a while, I try to reach somebody by email or I try to text them, and they say, I didn't get it. I said, how can you not get it? I sent it. And they said, well, we changed our information. So please update us on the information. You can do that on this card and slip that into the offering bag also. As a church family, um, we, uh, we really are close to each other. We're brothers and sisters in Christ is what we are. And so, you know, when, when somebody grieves in the family, all of us grieve in the family. And I wanted to pass our church's condolences to Gary Ryeski and his family on the passing of, of his brother. His brother was a twin, by the way. 
And so it's very, very close to Gary, and so we, uh, we want to hold him up in prayer. At the same time, we rejoice when people rejoice. And, and so we had some baptisms this past week. We had Joseph Morales and their Heather Wolf. Now, take a look at that. Um, now, if you look at Joe's picture, he's smiling there. It's, it may be hard to see from where you're at. I was talking to him when he came in this morning. He said, uh, he said Heather, and, and they're engaged. He said, Heather uh, is taking pictures of, of, of me now. She has the BC pictures, and I'm always frowning. <laughs> and now the difference is I'm always smiling. So we're happy for them. <laughs> well, we're going to pray for this service. It's going to be a great service. There's some wonderful things planned. And, uh, and so um, let's just ask the Lord to have his way. How many want God to have his way? Amen. Now, now, I know that you do, but I will tell you then that that's, that's risk-taking. God might have something in store for you, and, and maybe you haven't even prepared for that yet, for what God wants to do. For maybe, maybe God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost today. Are you ready for that? Oh, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? And uh, so there's other things that God wants for our life, and we just need to open ourselves up to what God wants us to do because he's good all the time. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful again for your blessings in our life. We don't deserve all you do for us. We don't deserve your goodness. That's grace. And we appreciate that, Lord. We believe that everyone is here by a, by a divine appointment today. And Lord, I know you have a plan and a purpose for their life. And I pray that today will be meaningful to them, that something special will happen in each and every heart that's here. And we'll give you all the praise and the thanks for it. Praise God. Now, I want you to know that there is a face for Parkway. When I say that, and everybody knows who it is because he's on the screen every week. He tells everybody about everything that's going on. That's Parkway's face, you know. I want you to know today is his 30th birthday. And so, if you get a chance later on, let him know how... I'm really happy that you are, that he's going to celebrate that day. God bless you all. I know you gave your life as part of your plan So I can live again Oh, oh, let the whole world know You got me, I got you You got me, I got you Like the moon and the stars Good morning and welcome to the weekly Parkway Church video update. My name is Ty and I will be giving you a brief look at everything happening right here at Parkway. Tonight we have a Parkway Church real life group leadership meeting in the adult classrooms at 5 p.m. At 5.30 there is a Parkway Church leadership meeting and at 6 p.m. we have Harpen Bowl right here in the worship center. Harpen Bowl is a time of prayer, praise and communion. Remember that there is no 5.30 p.m. prayer tonight. Next Sunday, July 1st, we will not have a PM service because there will be a PI graduation in Shawano, Wisconsin for the start of family camp. Coming up on Saturday, July 14th, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., we will be having our first annual Parkway Church Car and Motorcycle Show. The cost is $10 to enter your car or motorcycle. Spectators are completely free. All benefits from this car show will go towards faith initiatives. If you are new to Parkway or you've been recently baptized or if you have any questions about Parkway Church, we want to help you grow. Grow is a four-week class that happens right here in Adult Classroom A. It is ongoing and you can join at any time. For more information, you can visit guest services or email for you at theoakcreekchurch.com. This past week, we sent an email to all of our church members for them to update or confirm their contact information. If you did not receive that email, that means that we do not have an updated email address on file for you. To update that, just fill out a Connect card located in the pew pockets in front of you or on the back sides of the balcony. Drop that Connect card in the offering bag as it goes by. As always, if you have any questions about anything that we've announced, you can pick up a 411 information sheet, stop by the Parkway Happenings Wall, or visit us online, www.theoakcreekchurch.com. Now please enjoy this service. Let's all stand again this morning. This morning I'm thankful for the grace of God and that he is more than enough for me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, you 
Thank you. 
heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your grace.
the grave cannot contain you, for you wear the victory. Let's just worship him again. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being the overcomer, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus said that. He said, I have overcome the world. And we can take comfort and have peace in that. Praise God. Aren't you glad that you have that power in your life? Amen. There's so many things that we come up against. Amen. But we have that overcoming power. Praise God. You may be seated. Some of the songs that we talked about talk about the word worship. And uh, when we think about worship, I think the majority of us automatically thinks, well, we're doing that right now. We are worshiping God, and indeed we are. I, I think of a couple of other words when I think about worship. One is to honor Christ. Another is to glorify Christ. But the reality is, as we honor Christ, we glorify him way beyond what we do here right now. Would you say amen to that? When I leave this place, you know, and, and I go outside into what we consider to be the world or the system around us, uh, the reality is, is the way that we choose to live our lives is worship to the Lord. Would you say amen? It glorifies Him is what it does. As a matter of fact, the next part of our service is also worship to Him. We glorify God by our giving. And I want you to know if you're a guest today, we didn't ask you here to give. Please understand. That this is something that our church family does and it's part of our the love that we show to be involved in the cause of Christ by our giving and uh, and while this is not if Sunday where we'll pick on something to talk about I want you to know that uh, that we have a group of people that are going to be going and spending a week and uh, and we support that with the church's finances also and, uh, and it is Royal Family Kids. And I'd like to bring up the house lights a little bit because we want to see those that are, there are 10 of the members of our congregation that are going to camp to be with foster kids. Kids that, well, they don't have what you consider to be a normal family or a normally home life. Like many of those kids have never been to a church. And I haven't been around people that, um, and, and this is nothing to say about, I, I think it's wonderful what foster parents do. And I'm thankful for, the sacrifices that they make. But, uh, but many times, you know, these foster kids are not equipped to really help kids have an understanding about Jesus Christ. And so the camp is about that. It's showing God's love by taking care of these kids. And so we'd like all of our royal family volunteers to stand at this time. And we want to give you a hand. Thank you for... Amen. They don't... 
listen, they don't, they don't get paid to do this. I, I shouldn't say that. God, God has a way of blessing that's so amazing, does he not? But they take off from, from their jobs and, uh, and sacrifice and give by spending that time. And we love you and we thank you for what you do. Now we also, uh, not only do we support what they do, what Royal Family Kids does, um, with our finances and by having volunteers, but we pray for them. And we're going to do that right now. We want to pray for our volunteers and pray for the camp, that God would use that camp to minister, you know, say minister, that he becomes dad. He becomes the father to them in a very, very special and unique way. Would you pray with me? Praise God. Lord, we're grateful for volunteers, people that will take time from their schedule, giving of their lives in order to help children that are living in foster homes. Many times, Lord Jesus, they'll never see a normal family, but they have an opportunity to be with people that, that will really love them and really show Christ to them in such a unique and special way. We pray this camp this week is going to be a, a special camp. We pray that you keep everyone safe, Lord, and that, Lord, uh, you, by your spirit, Lord Jesus, will be able to minister, Lord, through these volunteers and through those other volunteers that are there throughout the week. And we're going to give you all the praise and the thanks for it. We pray your blessing now upon this offering. Again, it's, uh, it's for your purpose, for the cause of Christ that we give. And uh, we ask, Lord Jesus, that, Lord, you use it for that purpose in Jesus' name. Amen.
up a praise this morning. Lord, you are good. You are great. You are magnificent. You are supreme. You are sovereign. We give you our praise. We give you our worship. We exalt you. We extol you. We adore you. We magnify you. We give you praise and glory, God. And we want you more and more and more and more. so thankful for a God who will respond to the praises of his people. And I'm thankful for a people who will respond to the presence of God. He is here. He is here to minister. He is here to save. He is here to heal. He is here to restore. He is here to strengthen. He is here to make you a part of his family. To anoint you. To make you a peculiar people. A peculiar, a special treasure unto him. I'm 
thankful that he is here this morning. If you would grab your Bibles this morning, and I'm going to take a text to open from Proverbs chapter 3. And um, as you're turning to Proverbs chapter 3, we'll, we'll read verses 5 and 6. But I want to take this moment while you're turning there to say thank you to every one of you that um, looked after my children while we were gone, made sure that the parsonage didn't burn down, and made sure there was no wild parties. Thank you, Pastor, for keeping an eye on them. And uh, I would say thank you to all of you who prayed for us and for the, the meetings that we had while we were there. Um, so it's 13 hours difference uh, between here and there. And so uh, I would be getting a text letting me know that there were people praying for me. And I knew that it, it could very well be 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I do not take that for granted. I, I can tell you that each and every time that we step to minister, that I felt the anointing, I felt the presence of God. And uh, it, was, it was a long trip, long trip, 20-some uh, hours. And uh, we, we disembarked at midnight Sunday morning, and we were in the pulpit uh, at 10 o'clock that morning. And uh, I will tell you, uh, tired in body. And then we, we left Singapore Monday morning and went to Indonesia. And we were in Indonesia through Thursday and ministered every day, multiple times, some of the days. And uh, without fail, I would get a text. I want you to know that we're praying for you. And I, I so very much appreciate your, your prayer covering and I will, I will tell you um, a little bit about the trip uh, after we read and I have you be seated. Um, but I want to read this, and then uh, I also want to remind you that tomorrow morning at about 5.30, our students are going to descend on this place, and uh, they're going to get on a bus, and they're going to go to Shawano. Pastor was talking about camps. And uh, our junior campers just came home a couple days ago, and and I'm sure there's more, but I know of uh, Dave and Jenny Torres. Son Carter received the baptism of the Holy Ghost while he was there. Praise God. And uh, camp is a transformational moment in the life of a young person. And, uh, and so as we have these that are going to RFK camp, remember, seriously, remember to pray for them that are going to volunteer. These, these people carry the love of God. Uh, with them, and uh, while the context might be different, they have an opportunity to show Christ in a very special way. But I would also ask that you remember our students and those that are going to volunteer at youth camp, uh, because again, these are moments where young people hear the voice of God, receive a call of God upon their lives. Their lives are forever changed. Those services become a memorial in their lives, and uh, and I would ask that you would just. Pray for them, pray a covering over them, that when they come back, that it's not just a, a one-week thing that they experience and that they'll forget about in a couple of weeks, but it'll be something that forever changes the direction of their life. Amen? So would you read with me Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says this. We know this, probably can quote this. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. My title this morning, very simple thought, is here headed for there. Here headed for there. Would you one more time, would you go to the Lord with me in prayer for this message and for our time together. Lord Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for your presence that is here in the house this morning. We thank you, O oh God, that we have an understanding that no matter where we are, we cannot escape you. We can ignore you, but we cannot escape your presence. And so this morning, God, we are full aware of your presence. Lord, and we want to continue to welcome you in this place. We want to honor you and your presence. And we pray for an anointing upon the message this morning and 
and upon our time together, Lord, that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear what you would say to us, God, that we would receive the challenge and that we would step forward into what it is that you desire for us, that we would not simply be comfortable here, but we would allow you to move us there, there into what it is that you desire for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I would also remind you that this morning we are going to honor our graduates. And so at the end of my message, I have a, a, a portion where we're going to call them forward and we have a gift for them. Uh, we, again, this year are going to give each of our graduates uh, an apostolic study Bible. And uh, this is, to me, probably one of the sweetest gifts. I wish somebody would have gave me one when I graduated. Um, but uh, a, a powerful resource. Your Bible is a powerful resource. You need to remember that. I talk about this often. I appreciate the fact that you can turn your Bible on. I appreciate the fact that you can go anywhere you would like to go, and you can simply reach in your pocket, in your holster, in your purse, in your handbag, and pull it out and turn it on. Well, there's something about my Bible. You know, when, I, when I'm in a bad way and I lay my phone or my iPad on my chest and I talk, it's not the same as when I open the Word. So love, your, love the written Word. And so this morning, uh, I, I, I just would say to each of our graduates, congratulations. This message is for all of you. Amen. And uh, for each and every one of us that are here today. But a little bit about Singapore. My wife and I most certainly were privileged and honored to be able to go on this trip. Um, oftentimes, uh, as pastors, as ministers, we, we go and, and do not uh, have the luxury of being able to take our spouse with us. And so uh, you'll find that we'll be gone and sometimes for great lengths of time and and our spouse and our children are left behind. And uh, we were very privileged that uh, we were afforded the opportunity that Melissa would be able to go with me and uh, to be able to keep me company on the flight and talk to me and read stories to me and, and uh, wake me up whenever the food came by. Um, but she, um, she was very happy to go with me, and we had a, an extremely good time. We made what I would say some great relational connections. Um, the Lord moved in a very special way, uh, in, a, in a way that I have never, I don't think, ever experienced before in my life, in my ministry. Um, we did not see the dead raised. Uh, we did not see uh, miracles of, you know, the lame walking and the blind seeing. But we did see this, this progressive, continual building of the presence of God throughout the series of meetings to where, uh, you know, how when you come into a place and, and God moves in a very special way and we say, wow, wasn't God with us today? And then we come back the next time and maybe it's not like that. Maybe we just endured the service. Um, but it was not that way, and, and there were times that these, uh, so it was a camp for young adults, and then they had a small contingent of students that were there, but they would sit, no joke, for three hours. And in one of the three-hour sessions, I'm going to rat out my friend, Pastor Timothy, he talked for almost three hours straight. And I thought, dear God, I'm about to die. I've got to get up. I can't. But you know what they did? They had laptops out, books open, iPads, clickety, clickety, click, taking notes the entire time, hungry for what God was giving to them. And uh, I, I spoke for almost three hours uh, one afternoon, but I split it up and I had them do small groups in the middle of it so that I could get a break and I could sit down. It wasn't for them. It was all for me. But um, but we had uh, just a tremendous time, so many wonderful young leaders. I would say that their church is probably made up of probably, I would say, 60 to 70 percent uh, hyphen age people. That's incredible. They are, they are leading. They have bought into the vision. They're doing the work. Uh, I would tell you that they have uh, young adults um, who are 31, 32 years old that have uh, very successful careers. Uh, one of them is a, uh, an engineer, 
and he started a side business. The side business was doing very well, and um, he was lecturing at the university, so this is a pretty sharp fella making good money, and the Lord impressed on him, and he said to his pastor, you know what, uh, I, I want to come work at the church, and the pastor said, well, we don't have nothing to pay you, uh, and we don't really have nothing for you to do. But if you want to come hang out and see if there's something that you can give or if God speaks to you, we'd love to have you. So the young man puts his resignation in and says, I'm taking a year off and I'm going to go hang out with my pastor. I'm going to go hang out at the church and see what God will do in and through my life. Um, I'm not suggesting that anybody do that or that that's something that any one of us should be expected to do. But I, I, I say that to speak to the the hunger that these young adults have and uh, their hunger was then translated into their worship and into their response times of prayer that uh, I would get done speaking and they would still be in the altar travailing for an hour and a half after the service just travailing before God and uh, probably one of the, uh, the the sweetest things that we saw is every time I got up to minister, I would see this young woman. She was probably early 30s, and she would come and stand outside the door, and she would prop the door open where we were meeting, and she would sit on a chair, and, and every once in a while she'd answer her phone, and she would disappear, and she'd come back, and and so I, I asked Pastor Timothy Lee, I said, who is that woman that will not come in? And he said, that is the hotel manager. And she came and f sat outside the door every service that we had. And the last day, she was so hungry that she changed the schedule and said, I'm going to sit in the service. Now, the Bible says, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned, right? You get close enough to God, he's going to get you. And so here she comes, and she comes in, she sits in the very back row, and uh, the power of God is moving into place, and she's responding in her way, but I'm thinking, she ain't getting nothing out of it. I mean, stone-faced, not really moving, and and uh, I give the, the call for the altar, and all of a sudden, I see her hand up, but she didn't move. She's in the same place, her hands up, and a couple ladies go and begin to pray for her, and the tears begin to stream down her face, and, and God fills her with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. Now, I, I, I talked about her response uh, for a reason, and it's because afterwards she began to explain. She said, I have never cried in my life. Part of their culture is they do not show emotion. They're very stoic uh, in, in that part of the world. And, and as a result, she said, I, I've never cried, but I cannot stop crying. And I, I don't know what I'm feeling. I've never felt this before. And uh, so lo and behold, we make this connection, and I find out that she is applying to come to Chicago to pursue her Ph.D. She has her master's, and she's coming to get her Ph.D., and uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that we happen to leave Singapore, go to Indonesia, be at that particular hotel, and that God would have her there and us there just by happenstance. And so I would say uh, I believe that God is doing a work. I believe that revival is coming to that part of the world. I, we were there when uh, the, the summit happened between our president and that of North Korea. And uh, I, I just believe that we are going to see a door open for revival. We've talked for years about China, and I believe that we will see a door of revival opened into China. But I also believe that we are going to see a door of revival opened into North Korea. And I'm, I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm hoping I speak for you when I say I'm going to be a part of that. I, I'm going to see God do powerful things in that part of the world as a result of our continued faithfulness to him. So uh, I, there's so much we could share about the trip, but we were so humbled to be there. And the last day, uh, so we left at 3 o'clock in the morning on Monday. We left to go to the whole, uh, airport, and uh, we met with 50-some leaders of their church that Sunday night, and we were with them for about four hours 
And all I did is I carried a chair in my hand, and I'd walk from, every, from table to table, and I'd sit down, and I'd say, what questions you got? Personal, ministry, family, doesn't matter. What que-? And they would just ask you question after question. And, uh, and so I believe that we were a blessing to them. They were a blessing to us. We look forward to seeing what God will continue to do through that relationship. And uh, know that they love Parkway. And uh, they made sure to have me say hello to Sister Jenny. They, they love Sister Jenny. And uh, Sister Jenny, if, if you can get up to where you feel like you can sit in that airplane for that long, they would take you back for a month. I said I would, I would approve a month. Well, that's it. And then you got to come home. But uh, they love Sister Jenny. They love Brother and Sister Tamil. They love Parkway. And, and uh, they, they are so thankful for the, the influence of this church and its reach into that part of the world. And we most certainly as a church have made a mark in the lives of many people as a result of the faithfulness of you, of your giving, and most certainly as a result of Sister Jenny and the leadership of this church. So thank you for being you. Thank you for being a part. Thank you for allowing my family to be a part of what God is doing there as well. Uh, I want to move uh, from this and move into my message this morning. I believe that I have something very pertinent for us today. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, about Israel. And if you were to do a study on uh, the kings of Israel, you would come to a man by the name of Ahab, King Ahab. King Ahab was the seventh king of Israel after the nation was divided, uh, after having been unified under David and under Solomon. But Ahab um, became king of Israel when Solomon's son Rehoboam became, was moved to the throne and the people said, we don't want to follow him. And so we know that there were two tribes that stayed loyal and faithful to Solomon's son, and that was Judah and Benjamin. And then the other ten tribes broke away, and they then had their own king. And the seventh one was Ahab. And so it's within this context that we find uh, a very seri- a series of very wicked and evil kings over the nation of Israel. The seventh one, as I said, being Ahab. And he was a king that Scripture tells us did more evil, did more wickedness, did more to provoke God than any other king that was ever before him. This guy was a belligerent dude. This, this was a man who had no respect for God had no respect for the things of God, the word of God, or the men of God. And, and so we find that Ahab marries a woman against the command of God by the name of Jezebel. And Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbel, who was the king of the, Z- um, the Z- Zidonians. And she was a Phoenician princess who was very much like her, the people that her father ruled. But they were a worship, the worshipers of a false god by the name of Baal. Ahab knew better and had been instructed not to take this woman as his wife, but he does nevertheless, and he allows her to bring the worship of this idol and to begin to influence the people of God. Ahab builds a temple for the worship of this false god, and he establishes groves for worship. He brings and allows Jezebel to bring and supply 850 false prophets to further propagate this religion. These prophets sat at Jezebel's table every day and ate, were fed. She took care of them. Jezebel seemingly makes it her mission to bring this nation that she has married into under the singular worship of this false god Baal, even getting to the king, Ahab, to follow along in this pagan worship of this Phoenician god. She then commands that every priest of Jehovah God be rounded up and killed. And I will tell you that she proved to be very effective at this. If you were to read the scriptures in 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, you would find that She is doing such a good job that there was a governor by the name of Obadiah who who did not like this and and felt it obviously was wrong. 
and he would take the priests of God and he would hide them to protect them. But she proved to be very effective at rooting out uh, the worship of the one true God and turning the hearts of the people to Baal. The religion of, of Baal worship was heavily perverse and sexually immoral. People would sacrifice their firstborn to this idol as they felt that it would bring them favor and prosperity. There were prostitutes that were within the courts of the temple to incur the favor of this God to bring rain and fertility both to the land and to the people. Understanding that Baal controlled, they felt, the rain. He was the guy that controlled whether or not the ground gave harvest and whether or not the wombs of the women gave harvest in the way of children. And so they would come to the temple and they would be involved in all sorts of debauchery thinking that the more immoral and more perverse that they would be that it would please Baal and he would answer by sending rain. And so it's in this context that we hear about Elijah for the very first time. Elijah just shows up on the scene, never before talked about, never before described. And we find that Elijah the Tishbite comes to King Ahab with a rebuke and a judgment that as a result of his allowing and propagating the worship of this false god and allowing and promoting the whoredoms of God's people, that there would be no rain. Now, this is pretty significant because the people are worshiping a God that they believe controlled the rain. And Elijah rolls in and says, oh, by the way, because of your failure, because of your wickedness, because of your sinfulness, I'm closing up heaven. There's not going to be any dew and there is not going to be any rain until I say so. Now, pretty grand statement. You have to remember this is a direct assault against the religion that is being established among the people in that day. This is a direct assault against the God which the people believe controlled the reign. This is a direct assault against the king and the queen of Israel. You have to understand what a dangerous situation this was for Elijah because we know that Ahab was not intimidated by the man of God. He was not intimidated by the voice of God and was apparently not worried about the wrath of God either. This man had fallen so far in the sensual desire of his flesh that he was willing for the entire nation to suffer as a result of his failed leadership. He was most certainly at this point an extremely dangerous man. And Elijah was risking his life with this utterance of judgment. And so Elijah gives King Ahab this announcement of judgment of no dew, no rain, and then receives instruction from the Lord to make his way to the brook Cherith. And if you were to read this in 1 Kings 17, verses, I would say, 2 through 5 probably, you'll find this discourse between the Lord and Elijah, and he tells him to leave where he is, leave here and go there. And in going there, he finds that God will then bring provision to him. It was here that God gave a command to the ravens to sustain Elijah, a bird that we would consider the garbage handlers of today. They ate dead animals, and God says, I have commanded the ravens to bring you bread and meat twice a day. I'm going to feed you every day by the ravens. Go sit there, and I'll take care of you. For the entirety of this drought, which was to last three and a half years. How many times do we miss God's provision by not following the direction that he gives to us? How many times do we allow what seems to be comfortable and possibly familiar to keep us from experiencing the mighty hand of God at work within our lives? I say today, I wish that the people of God will learn to respond quickly and correctly to his direction. That when God would give instruction, that rather than us trying to think about it, rather than us trying to determine if it really is him or if it's just us, Speaking, that we would step according to the voice of God and we would move in the direction that he has called for us. But you see, we oftentimes get stuck in our current blessings. We oftentimes get stuck in the familiarity of where God has us when God would move us to something else 
to do something greater in our lives. And so I, I seem to find Elijah in this situation. He's sitting by the brook and the ravens are coming and they're supplying meals for him. And, and the brook then dries up as a result of the drought. And the word of the Lord comes to Elijah and he says, get up from here and go to Zarephath. There's a widow woman that you will find there. And when you get there, she will sustain thee there. You see, Elijah could have sat right there and said, but God, you've been doing such a good job here. Why do I need to leave, man? I, I built myself a nice little shack. I got a good view of the water. Why don't you just turn the water back on? And I'm okay with the Raven Express delivering my meals. I'm comfortable. But God says, you need to move. And so when we look at 1 Kings 17 and verse 9, it says, Arise, get thee the Zarephath which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. We must be aware that there are times yet, even within the provision of God, that he will cause us to move, to be uncomfortable within the times of provision and blessing, that his power might be further revealed in our lives, and that he might be able to do greater things within us, that he might test us and prove us further. But we will have to be willing to move from here to there to experience that provision. We can decide to stay where we are and complain about the fact that the blessings have dried up and starved to death spiritually, or we can respond to the moving of God and go and experience the provision that He has for us. We cannot say, haven't I done enough already? Why not just bring the provision here? We must move from the place where we are to the place that God is calling us. You see, we may even miss the very affirmation of God in our lives by not moving. Let me explain this to you. When the Lord instructs Elijah to leave the brook and to head to the widow's house, I have to believe it wasn't just simply to feed him. Because if it was, there's only one story of a meal that was prepared for him there. But what happens, we find that when, he, when Elijah gets there, he sees the widow woman and she's preparing, gathering sticks to make a fire. And he says, hey, make me... A meal of cake. And she says, oh, my Lord, I, I was just gathering sticks to make a fire. And I was going to make the last meal that we have in the house for me and my son. We were going to eat it and die. And Elijah says, well, you know, sometimes man of God can come across a little bit arrogant. And if I ever do, I apologize. I don't ever mean to be that way. A little bit presumptuous. And he says, listen, listen. Why don't you make me one first? She just got done telling him, I'm going to make the last one I got. We're going to eat it and die. And then you're going to say, just get, hold on, make it for me and let me eat it. So she does. I love faithful people, right? So she makes the meal. And the Bible says that the, the meal barrel in her house and the oil, the cruise of oil in her house never went dry for the remainder of the, the, of the drought. So God does a miracle for her. But then the Bible says that a, a short time goes by and the son of the widow dies. Well, ain't that great? And so she comes to the man of God and she says, look, what are you doing to me? Uh, you come here, and now you're bringing my past sins upon me and making me pay for it by my child dying? And Elijah says, where's he at? Give him to me. And as the story goes, he takes him into the house, and he, he begins to plead with God, and God restores life back to the child, and he brings the child back to his mother, and he gives the child to his mother, and she makes this statement. And I'm going to tell you, this is the entire reason why Elijah went there. I believe, my opinion, you got one, this is mine. She says this to him, now I know you are truly the man of God. He did a miracle, and the meal is not running out in the barrel. The last drips of oil in the cruise, it keeps dripping every time she goes to pour it. That wasn't enough. 
But now I know truly you are the man of God. I want you to understand that Elijah was a man fraught with insecurities, dealt with fear. We don't know a lot about him, but if you follow him, you find out that he was filled with self-doubt and insecurities. I would tell you, as a matter of fact, this boy was so insecure that he would be moved to a place of depression till at one point he contemplated what we would call suicide. Just take my life. I'm done. I, I'm done. I'm over. But so we know that here Elijah is and he receives affirmation from God through the voice of this widow. Truly, you are the man of God. And it's not long and the voice of the Lord comes to Elijah again and instructs him to go present himself to King Ahab. Now you have to understand this is a big deal. Because Ahab is sent out to all of the surrounding countries saying, Have you seen Elijah? And if you did, send him to me, dead or alive. I don't care. That guy needs to die. He shut up the rain. And so Elijah makes his way. And as the story goes, he's standing before Ahab. And Ahab makes this snarky comment to him as he rides up and he says, You who troubles Israel. To which Elijah replies, It's not me that's causing the problem, but you. But he makes a challenge to Ahab and he says, God is going to send rain. But I want you to gather all of the people of Israel and all of the prophets of Baal and meet me at Carmel. And so as the story goes, they meet there at, at Mount Carmel and Elijah stands up before all the people and he makes this statement to the people of God. And he says, how long will you halt between two decisions? How long will you stand in the middle? Do I go this way? Do I go this way? Should I step this way? Should I run that way? What do I do? He says, you need to be serving God. But he says, today, he said, let's make a, a proclamation that the God that answers by fire, him will we serve. And so he says to the prophets of Baal, and many of you probably know the story, but he says to him, I'm going to let you guys go first. I, I'll, I'll defer to you. You go first, and, and you pray to Baal, and if he sends fire, awesome, but if he don't, it's my turn. And so the scripture says that they begin in the morning and they prepare the altar and they put their sacrifice on it and they begin to holler out to Baal, Hear us, O Baal! Hear us, O Baal! And the Bible says that about noontime, Elijah stirred and he hollers at him, Hey, maybe you should holler a little bit louder. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, he's in the bathroom. Read the Bible. That's what it says. Maybe he's in the outhouse relieving himself and he can't hear you. Holler a little bit. Loud. Maybe he's daydreaming. Maybe, you know, maybe he fell asleep. Holler louder. Maybe he went on a journey to a far country. Holler a little bit louder. And he's mocking them and provoking them. And the Bible says that they begin to cut themselves. And they begin to throw themselves on the altar. Hear us, O Baal. Hear us, O Baal. And the scripture says that about the time of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah is done making fun. He's tired of listening to him. He's tired of the scene that he's seeing. And he says, all done, my turn. And the Bible says that he gathers the people to him. And he begins to rebuild the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He builds the altar. He puts the wood on it. He calls for the sacrifice. Puts the sacrifice on it. Tells him to dig a trench around it. Tells him to dump water on it. No, dump more water. No, one more time. Dump more water on it. Until the sacrifice is saturated and the trench is filled with water. And he kneels down. And he prays, prays a very simple prayer. And he says, God, this would be in my words, God, you told me to come here. And I'm going to step. And I told them that the God that would answer by fire, we would serve. So today, I bring them before you. Hear our cry and answer. 
And the Bible says immediately that fire fell from heaven. You know, I just want you to know, I don't know how many of you have ever seen T-ball, but, you know, you got this little stick and you put this little ball on it, right? And sometimes when the kids take a good, healthy swing, they hit the stick, right? Not only in my mind is Elijah standing there thinking, oh, yeah, fire just came down. God, you just hit a home run. But you just crushed the enemy that was upholding this false religion, this false idea. You just showed yourself strong on the behalf of your people. And so we know that fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice, consumes uh, all the material, consumes the stones, licks all the water up in the trench, licks all the dust up that's in the area. And the Bible says that the people immediately say, the Lord, he is God. Him will we serve. And so Elijah says, Take all those prophets, take them down by the brook, and kill every last one of them. And so Elijah says, uh, Ahab, while they're doing that, I want you to know that I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. And we know the story he goes and prays, and a, man, a cloud the size of a man's hand comes, and man, it rains like mad. And, and Elijah runs and outruns Ahab's chariot and meets, runs to the gate of Jezreel, and a message comes to Elijah from the sweet, pretty queen. And she says, so help me. What you did to my prophets, you will be just like them come tomorrow. I'm going to kill you. Now, you got to understand something. This guy just saw a monumental miracle. And some woman opened. Now, I'm not talking bad about any of our women, okay? But some woman's going to run at the mouth and say, I'm going to get you. He wasn't afraid to stand in front of King Ahab. He wasn't afraid to stand against 400, 800, however many of the prophets that were actually there that day. He wasn't afraid to make some great statement that God's going to answer by fire. And this woman says, by the way, I'm going to kill you. And he starts running. Well, so he runs. He's in fear. He's in denial. And he runs and he finds himself under a tree, the Bible says. And he begins to complain to God. I hear Jonah in this complaint. And he says, you might as well just kill me. I'm the only one left. Nobody else loves you. You know, everybody hates me. I'm just going to go eat a juicy worm, right? He's upset. And so God begins to deal with him and he He's in a cave and he takes a, well, first he takes a nap and he wakes up and an angel's there and an angel had prepared a meal for him. And the angel says, you need to eat this because you're going to have to have it for your journey. And the Bible says that that one meal sustained him for 40 days. Now, that's a meal, right? <laughs> but we find this guy sitting in a cave and the voice of the Lord comes to him and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah begins to complain, begins to talk about all of his insecurities, talk about all of his fears. And I'm making light of this a little bit, okay? But I want you to know, I make light of it from the fact that we, every time we get our focus off of God, the things that we talk about, the things that we allow ourselves to get discouraged and depressed about, I want you to know they really are foolish, okay? Now, I'm not discrediting anything that we feel, anything that we go through. But if we were to put the things that we are going through in context with our God, it's nothing, okay? But so here's Elijah. Here's Elijah. He's sitting there sucking his thumb, having a bad day, feeling bad for himself. He's the only one. Nobody else loves God. He's the only one that loves God. God might as well just kill him. Let's just get it on with and be done. And so God's like, but come on, man. And so we know the, the Lord comes to him in an earthquake, right? And there's lightning and thunder, and then there's strong wind. And, and Elijah's looking, well, God, where are you at? No God. And all of a sudden the Bible says the Lord speaks to him in a still, small voice. And he says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? That's what he says. What are you doing here? And Elijah does not get his wake-up call. 
And he says the same exact thing that he said before God walks by him in a demonstrate, uh, demonstrative move of nature. And he says, I'm the only one. Ain't nobody that loves you. Nobody that serves you. Might as well just kill me. And the Lord gives him command. And he says, I want you to go anoint Hazel. And I want you to anoint Jehu. One's going to be king over Syria. The other one's going to be king over Israel. And then I want you to go and I want you to anoint a man by the name of Elisha. And he is going to stand in thy room. He's going to take your job. So you know what Elijah does? He goes and finds Elisha and anoints Elisha. Throws the mantle on him, right? We know the story. And the chariot of fire comes and takes Elijah away. And but he never went and anointed those two men to be king. Now, I want you to understand that there are times that we can not obey the voice of God and not lose out on our salvation, but we can miss things that God would do in our lives, but we can allow the enemy to continue to still have power and access over the lives of others because of our inaction. Ahab and Jezebel should have died within days of that meeting, but they didn't. They outlived Elijah. It's Elisha that goes and anoints Jehu, who Jehu then runs in and is in the battle, and Ahab dies, and then he rides up to the, to the tower where Jezebel is and says, who's on the Lord's side? And the, the eunuchs throw her out the window, and she's trampled underfoot. And You see, we have to understand that God calls us to a place but sometimes the fear of the unknown, sometimes the voice of the enemy, sometimes your own voice keeps you from walking into the promise that God has for you. And so this morning, I, I, we have to understand that we are going to have to get to a place that we will rebuild the altar of God in our lives, that we will get to the place that we will sacrifice who we are for His will, that we will hear Him and we will move, that we will not allow fear to come in the in the play in our lives to where it circumvents what God would really do through us. We have to also understand that we cannot allow the fear that sometimes we allow to take hold of our heart to lead us to a place that we, that we almost nurture that fear, that it moves us to a place of depression, that we become so disconnected from what God would do through us. We cannot allow our fear to keep us from moving from this place to the place that God desires to take us to. We have to keep walking into the purpose and plan of God for our lives. You see, we will all face problems that are bigger than us. We will all go through things that we never thought we would. Some of us will go through things that we didn't think we could go through, but we'll go through them. In these moments, in these situations, where do we turn when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel like the enemy, when problems and situations roll up on us? Do we look to ourselves and do we, do we realize how insignificant we are and allow ourselves to become overwhelmed and broken and, and discouraged to the point that we never get victory? Or do we finally look beyond ourselves? Or do we, do we cope with our fears by ourselves or... How, how do we find in those moments that we, we feel that fear that comes upon us, that darkness, that deep darkness that would overwhelm us? How do we deal with it when it seems to be, on, to be beyond the courage that we have to fight? How do we tap into God's power when our faith seems to be so small? How do we pay bills that are greater than our personal finance? How do we defeat enemies that seem to be too strong for us? How do we move from here to there? I told the worship team this morning, we all struggle with this. We all have these moments in our lives. We'd be lying if we said that there weren't days that we would think, Ugh, I don't know what I'm going to do here. We'd all be lying if we said that there weren't times where we tried to figure it out on our own before we took it to God, too. But you see, we must remember in these situations that our God is bigger, that our God is greater, that He's more powerful, that He has more at His beck and call than we ever do, that we understand that He's more powerful than our fears. 
In Isaiah, the 41st chapter, the Lord says this, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I, I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God is bigger than our fears. He's better than our faith. Has more provision than our lack. And is stronger than my enemy. There is nothing that comes into my life that is greater than my God. There is nothing that comes into my life that when I find myself here and God says, I need you there, that when I look at the process of the move, I say, I don't know if I can do it. You're right. You probably can't. But he is more than able to carry you from here to there. We need to get to the place that we're willing to move from here to there. Our God is able to keep us and to lead us to the place that he desires us to be. Paul said this about the Lord. God is able to keep us and to complete in us the work which he began. We simply must not allow our fear of the unknown to stall us out. But lean on God and trust in him and then he would perform his work in us. The scriptures that I read this morning. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. We've got to get to the place that we stop trying to figure it out. And we start submitting to the will of God. You want me to go there? I don't know. Make the way plain. I'll walk it. You just show me where I must walk. And he will direct our paths. This morning, I, I know that there are so many of us that have experienced these moments of transitions in our life. Many of us have uh, graduated from high school, graduated from college, but then we've graduated into relationships and, and marriage, and some of us have experienced divorce and loss and financial ruin and sickness. And there are times within these moments of transition that the fear is very real. That the fear is overwhelming, and we don't know if we can take another step. And I have said for many years that I believe that it, at every transitional moment in your life, you need to build an altar. And you need to ask God to refill you with the Holy Ghost. At every transitional moment in your life, you need a refreshing. Because you move into a new dimension in your life and you can't fight the same way you fought in the last one. You can't expect to necessarily just say the same thing and it's going to have the same effect when you move in. I, I think about young people when they go from middle school to high school, right? They roll in and they're freshmen. They ain't nobody. And that's scary. But when they move from high school to college, that's a new dimension. That's not another level. It's a new dimension. Everything, the whole package changes. And so this morning, I, I'm going to call for our graduates this morning. I, we've asked Brother and Sister Tamil to help us with this. And, and if you would make your way over there, um, I'm going to call your name, graduates, and I would ask that you would come immediately. OK, do not wait. Uh, I want to give you some instruction uh, right here at the end. Um, so as I call you, please come and they will hand you your Bible. And then what I would like is I would like all of the graduates, if you would just stand here at the front and you can face me when you get here. OK, so very first one, Elias McDonald, would you come? Wyatt Mevis. I'm, I'm just looking to see if I see movement. Do I see any movement? Uh, you know, the other thing I'm thinking, I wonder how many of these are in serving in Sunday school probably this morning. So if, if they don't come, uh, I see people running out. Maybe they're going to go get them. So Elias McDonald, Wyatt Mevis, Jennifer Redlick, Xavier Ross, <laughs> Elena Schuster. Uh, I'll give them some time. No, go get your Bible. Go get your Bible and then come back. Doesn't matter how old we are, the instruction, it doesn't seem to all register. <laughs> You're laughing, but you know you struggle with it too. Yeah. Proud of these. John Zozda. <laughs> A 
Eric Velarde. Justin Widmer. Boy, this is thin. You know, I, so I, I, this is one of those moments where I say, you know, I sent an email out. We, we sent out a reminder and said, we're going to do this. Please be in the service this morning because, right, uh, make sure your information is updated so you actually get those, that communication. Uh, Larissa Zimmerman. And then Emma Snow. And then lastly, John Long. So not all of them are here, but I want you to know I have a message for, for our graduates. First, I want to say to, to each of you how very uh, proud we are of you. And uh, you will find uh, when you open your Bibles that uh, both Pastor Tamil and I wrote a note to you in, in the side, the cover of this. And this is where somebody needs to hold up the awe, Pastor, right? <laughs> but w we wrote uh, a note to you, and it seems like every year and um, when, when we do things like this, uh, I always include my opening text today. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not, right? Uh, because I believe that's a life principle. If, if you can apply that to your life, no matter where you are, if you stay here or if you go on to somewhere in ministry and education and career and family, no matter where you go, if you apply that principle to your life, God will keep you. God will direct your path. He will ordain the things that you would do. And so I, I have a challenge for you as, as graduates, and I would ask for the church to stand this morning. Um, and, and I'm going to say that when I'm done here, I'm going to open this altar and you can come and pray. And if uh, there's family that wants to come and gather around these and pray for these, um, again, this is a very transitional moment in their lives. You need a refreshing in the Holy Ghost. Um, you do. You need, you need that freshening in, in the presence of God. And so my challenge to not only you as graduates, but my challenge to us as a church is we have to remember that we are here right now. But there is a there we're heading to. Some of it is in a short context of time. Some of it is in an eternal context of time. But God is drawing every one of us to a there. But we need to respond to his voice. You see, the Bible says that he will make the crooked way straight. And I oftentimes think about the wanderings of my life, right? Oh, God. I made, Emma, I made a lot of mistakes. I really did. Uh, a lot of things that I wish I could take back. A lot of things that I wish I could do over. A lot of commitments and consecrations in my life that I wish I would have made sooner. But the beautiful thing about God making the crooked way straight, you know, I say he does not always... Uh, ordain every step that we take because we're uh, we'll speak our language okay we're dumb right we're just dumb and we do our own thing sometimes but if we will recommit ourselves to God he'll order every one of those even the mistakes that we make he'll order them for his glory he will still find us usable and placeable in some way within his kingdom and so this morning understanding that we are all headed somewhere there is a there that we are traveling to it is important that that we respond correctly because whether or not we arrive at that place depends entirely upon us I, I it's a newsflash okay not even god can put you where you won't go he will submit to your will even in your disobedience. God has a there fashion for my life. And I want to arrive at it. Therefore, my decisions today and tomorrow, they matter. So, what is God able to accomplish through your life? Again, that's entirely up to you. How will you respond? And so, 
my challenge is that we, we cannot let fear, we cannot let self-doubt, we cannot allow insecurity to get in the way of what God has spoken over our lives. The world says a lot of crummy things to you. You say a lot of crummy things to yourself. But I want you to know that God says beautiful things about you. God believes beautiful things about you. You know, by the way, all of you as well. And so this morning, uh, I would ask if there's family that wants to come and pray that you come right now. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck in the rush. So if you want to come and pray for any of these students, please come. Any, uh, anybody that's relationally connected that wants to come, please come. And this morning, as, as, we, as we move into this time of committing ourselves to God, recommitting ourselves to God, I look at Elijah powerful man of God, yet a, a man who was fraught with insecurity and self-doubt, that thought it was better to be gone than here, to where God moved his anointing to another. I don't want God to do that in my life, and I don't believe that God wants to do that in your life. I believe that wherever you go, God will use you. I believe God has a very specific plan for each of your lives. That no matter where you go, He will use you in a mighty way. And so I want to pray a prayer blessing over you. And then I'm going to open this altar for any of you that want to come and, and maybe recommit yourselves to the will of God this morning. We're here today, but we're going somewhere. And I want to make sure that I get there. And I get where God wants me to go. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we love you. I thank you for our graduates. Lord, a tremendous accomplishment graduating from high school today. And yet still a greater accomplishment as they continue to move forward and graduate from college. And some will continue on pursuing another level of education. But, Lord, I pray that no matter if they move from high school into more education, they move from high school into the workforce, God, no matter where their journey takes them, I ask, oh, God, for your hand of protection to be upon them. God, that you would release favor to them. God, that you would open doors of opportunity for them, that they would find prosperity and health, God, that they would find the very desires of their heart, but, Lord, I pray that they would always remember, Lord, that if they would commit themselves, their hopes and their dreams to you, you will bring them to a place of completion and fulfillment. God, where they will stand in a place fulfilled and hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So, Lord, we pray, oh God, for us as a body of believers today, Lord, that you would bring us to a place of recognition. God, that we would understand that our enemy is already defeated, that his voice carries no weight. We give his voice legitimacy. He is a loser and a liar, and he would propagate an untruth in our lives. Help us, O oh God, to recognize that which is not from you, that we would stand boldly upon your word and upon the promises that you have declared over our life. God, you are calling us in this day to something greater. Help us to be willing to move past our fear of the unknown, to step out of the boat and, God, walk on the water, that we would not be afraid of the lion's den or the fiery furnace, but we would commit ourselves to you knowing that you will keep us, that you will not forsake us, that you will uphold us, that you will bless us, God, that you will position, O oh God, and prosper us. Lord, we commit these to you today. And we thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This altar is open this morning. Feel free to come. But remember this. God loves you. Don't let anything bring doubt against his love for you. And most certainly, do not let the enemy sow seeds of doubt in your heart that you might think there's no way God could still love me. He loves you, the Bible says, with an everlasting love. Remember that. In Jesus' name.
give me faith to trust what you say that you're good your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life give me faith to trust what you say that you're good 